Amen. Good morning. Thank you, TJ. Thank you for all the men who led up here this morning. It is no small thing that we get to do to gather as a, as a church, to gather as a congregation. What a joy it is. James, thank you for emphasizing the, the, the connection of Christ to the unity we have, that he brought that up just as he was headed to the cross. It is a powerful thing we participate in. These are the good old days. We're in them. That we have God's word in our hands. We have a nation that is written into its founding document that we are free to choose to follow our God without their molestation. We bother ourselves. We mess up our own freedom of choice in God, but, but the government has promised that they won't. We are at a time where we have interconnection with people around the world. We'll prove that in a few minutes as we're going to send a few people around the world. This morning, our, uh, our mission team is down at Anchor Point. They were helping out a children's program in Homer this past weekend, and Homer and Anchor Point congregations working together. And uh, folks at the Anchor Point Church were so excited to have them down there, they called us up and said, please, please, can we keep them through Sunday? Because they were going to come back yesterday afternoon and be here with us this morning. And we said, sure. And David Aguilar is speaking there this morning. We have interconnections in so many places that technology and Lord's blessings have given us. Let us always remember the power that we go through our day with. Be purposed. Be deliberate. Jesus said, lift up your eyes. I, I say, open our eyes. I tell my family, let's go through the days with our eyes open and notice what God is doing around us. Good advice given to us uh, years ago in one of our men's group studies is find what God is doing because he is actively working in this congregation and in this community. Find what God is already doing and join him. So if he opens a door of opportunity, he is obviously working there. If he, if he provides a person for you to connect with, uh, with the word, he has obviously been working on that person's life already. And we'll see some more of that, God willing, this morning. So as much as my optimistic attitude has, us, has me thinking about how wonderful things are, we have some serious difficulties in a nation, as a world. We've always had the mess of sin, uh, but we are falling under some of Satan's traps in other ways that leads us to more di difference and distance from God. Let's go to our Father in prayer before we get into his word. Holy Lord, we dearly need you to take hold of us, maybe in a more fundamental way, to open our eyes in a more obvious way, that we can see our own weaknesses in connection to the world, in compromise with the world, in in uh, being satisfied with less, being satisfied with uh, silence, being satisfied to stand on the sideline. Father, I pray that you will help us as men and women, as families, as brothers and sisters to stand up and to take the opportunities and the directions you give us. Help us, Father, to learn from your word as we dive into it this morning. Amen. So we're in the second chapter of 1 Timothy. 
And we have experienced, I don't know how far you go back, but my, my own history lesson, and I only have a, a microcosm of memory in, in history. I only remember certain things uh, as we go back, but, but I have an American-centered perspective on history. The Industrial Revolution was a big deal in the development of our country, and I remember studying that. And the, uh, the, the, the movement of farming across our country and the, and the expanse of faith. Uh, Scott Crockett just helped us to study uh, how different groups of people opened the word throughout history and came to different kinds of conclusions sometimes, but how, how God kept his church active through the centuries and how we uh, get the blessing of being uh, his church today. Uh, but a lot of that worked our way through uh, the early years of people coming to this continent. I say all that to say that uh, I'm gonna mention something that we have a familiarity with, but I don't want to think that we are the only ones to have this problem, but we have a crisis and have had a crisis of men in being in the right position in our country in the, with the Lord. I am not much of a mechanic. I like to work on cars, but I'm not very good at it. I started out not very good at it, and then I worked on a bunch of cars and I stayed not very good at it. But I used to remember that uh, I, my old Dodge, if you let go of the steering wheel, you could test, this was my test for alignment, two things. One, I looked at the tires, and two, I'd let go of the steering wheel going down the road. And if the car did this or this, I go, ah, I need an alignment. That doesn't work on modern cars, and I'm not sure why. I don't know where, what they changed in all the steering mechanism and all the alignment mechanisms that uh, my cars never do that these days. I don't think they're always in alignment, and my tires still wear unevenly. You know, when your tires wear unevenly, you, you hate the message. You go in, you get a new set of tires, and the, and the guy says, uh, these are wearing unevenly. And you say, yeah, that's why I want some new ones. And the answer is, and guys, you, and most of you all know this, well, putting on new tires isn't going to solve your problem. That's just going to give you another set of tires to wear out of the line, wear unevenly. So... If your car, if you don't spend the extra, and it used to be like 60 or $80 to get an alignment, and I couldn't afford that. Now it's like $600 or $800 to get an alignment, and I definitely can't afford that. But, but I don't know what it costs alignment these days, but everything, every time I go say something to a mechanic, it's $600, so. <laughs> I figured it's $600 for an alignment, too. But if you just change out the tires and you don't change the alignment, you won't have a worthwhile set of tires anymore. We have a crisis in a lot of ways in the world. We, we always have since, since Adam and Eve, and we're going to go there in a minute. But let's just talk about men right now. It's a week before, you know I love special days. It's a week before Father's Day, and we'll be talking about that a bit next week. But we need an alignment with the Lord. And God always started with the men. He always went to the men in his covenants. He always went to the men in his dealing with people to begin with. He always started with the men to check their connection and fellowship of him. Second, Timoth second chapter of 1 Timothy is a very useful chapter. I uh, underline verse 4. If it's not underlined in your, in your Bible, it's a good thing to, to bring up when somebody uh, brings up a, uh, the idea that we don't have free will, that, that God preordains who he will save and who he won't save. That's not an accurate statement. It says God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And that's the truth, that all people have the free choice to choose and follow or reject and leave 
our Heavenly Father. What a power you have in your life to be able to tell the God of the universe, no, I don't want to follow you. That's an incredible boldness that people choose. But it's our choice. It's our freedom. It's our free will. He goes on and talks about uh, his work as a preacher. And then he talks about men and women. And he says, I want men everywhere to pray. I want men to be the ones who stand up and lead in prayers. I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. I don't know if lifting up hands is here or here or here. I don't know where hands are. We don't get a position too, much, too often in Scripture. We have Jesus flat on his face in prayer. We have others kneeling in prayer. We have others in bed in prayer. We have others standing in prayer. We have others looking to heaven in prayer. We have others looking at the ground in prayer. So I'm not sure the position is, is as key as the other part of the instruction, that everywhere men are, they should be leading prayers. I want men in every place to be those who lead prayers. I'm not sure why it is, men, that we are happy in certain circumstances just to fade to the background. Let me just stand against the wall and let everybody else uh, run this thing here. But I think we would do that in the Lord's church if it wasn't for scriptures like these that says, step forward, step up, men. And then he has an instruction for women their modesty, their discretion, their care, and, and how they present themselves. And then he has an instruction about teaching, that he wants women to learn in a teaching situation with men to learn quietly, to learn uh, from a man, and not to, to exercise authority, not to take charge of the classroom, not to be the one teaching with authority over men. And those are mechanical instruction. Those are interesting instructions. Those are obviously useful in God's will for the working of the church. I wanted to get to the next verse, verse 13. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. There's an aspect to this that is not at all cultural. Don't believe the modern teachers who said this is a temporary or a cultural teaching for the first century. Paul doesn't give a temporary or cultural explanation. He jumps all the way back to the very first man and woman and says because of the choices made then, this is what we do now. There was a lot more time in between when Paul wrote this and when Adam and Eve walked on the earth than there is between now and the time when Paul wrote it. So the history before Paul is, is much, much longer than the history from us back to the first century. So this is not just a temporary uh, a teaching about a temporary working of the church. This is a calling all the way back to the beginning to how God treated men and how men treated God. Let's turn back to Genesis and get a little clip of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3 is the fall itself. It's the, it's the first sin. It's the lie of Satan where Satan gets in and he, and he, and he attacks the very essence of what it means for God to speak to us. He attacked the very essence of that, of the hearing of the word of God and the processing it through our own free will. He got right there into our free choice and pried a little crack in our minds with what God said or what God didn't say that we somehow have the authority or the wisdom or the, or the whatever it might be to, to, to make a choice for God's word. And he says, you surely will not die. That ugly half-truth contradicting God's very truth. So Eve takes of the fruit 
and eats. And she turns and gives it to her husband. She gives it to Adam in verse 6. And it says in verse 6 that while this was going on, Adam was with her. A man standing off to the side, letting things go on in front of him. The same thing we're, we tend to do now. Well, I'll just step back and stand against the wall and watch what's going on in front of me. Is what Adam did in the very first sin of man, in the very first conflict of man and Satan. He stood back and let the scenario play out in front of him, let his wife deal with the half-truths and the lies that Satan gave her, let his wife deal with the temptation and the difficulty of choosing or not choosing what God said to leave alone. He was with her, and he ate. Their eyes were opened. That's not the kind of opening eyes I was talking about a minute ago. This is a very sad event where they see in a different way. They lost their purity. They lost their innocence, and they covered up their nakedness. So Paul knew who sinned first. That's a, you can argue that point if you want to. Paul said who sinned first, but verse 9, who's God looking for first? Who's God looking for? Adam, where are you? Where are you? And the answer he gets, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. God doesn't talk about the sin. God doesn't talk about the, the, the crude garments that they had put over themselves. God doesn't talk anymore about his hiding. God asks him a question. Who told you? Who told you you were naked? You have violated the innocence I gave you. You have violated the position I put you in. You see, Paul says Adam was formed first, and there's a, and there's a positional uh, requirement, there's a positional responsibility that God had for Adam. And men, it's still our positional responsibility. It's still with us today. We read about the teaching aspect of it a little bit in, in 1 Timothy, but go back to the New Testament and go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, if you will. Chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Be imitators of me just as I am also of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I have delivered them to you. And that's a clue of what we're supposed to do as a congregation, is to be careful with what Paul and the other apostles delivered to the first century church. That's why we're careful with the word. It's God's word, and Paul praised them because they were careful with it. And then he adds this as he gets on to another discussion. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. He gives a lesson in headship, and that's really the scope of where I wanted to be this morning, and we will we'll park it there and, and attend to this in other, in other lessons. But I wanted to talk about headship, about this positional requirement, men, that we are asked to be in. We have a head position. We have a headship position. It is specifically, it is specifically in relation to a woman, not to women in a, in a plural sense across the country, but to a woman. Christ 
is the head of everyone, every man. Christ is the head of every man. And man is the head of his wife. We know this is spelled out in Ephesians chapter 5. It's a headship role. It's a positional role. It's a, it's a need we have. And we see so painfully the result of, of modern history, of, of man's continued rebellion against God. And, and some of it's not even rebellion. Even willing men who want to follow the Lord and their family don't know how because we pulled on the garment. I go back to, in my mind, to losses made in the Industrial Revolution, which is why I mentioned it uh, 10, 15 minutes ago, that, that this, this new pattern of living that takes men out of the home, sends them off to a factory someplace or to an office someplace or to a distant work site someplace, and they're gone throughout the day, throughout the week, now throughout the weekend that we have pulled men out of their homes, that children no longer work alongside of their father, that we've, we've lost the, 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 the living quarters above the shop, the shop downstairs in the building where, where you did your leather work, where you did your carving, where you did whatever you did as your craft and your children worked with you, or more commonly and more clearly understood, on the farm where every hand was required to help keep the family alive. And men were at the center of it, partly because we had the stronger back, but also because God gave to us an intentional mind, a goal-setting personality that we say, we're going to do this job and we go through it to get it done. That single-mindedness that men are so good at, that determination, that stubbornness, that we're going to do this aspect and they pull their children along with them. And when you pull on that thread and weaken that and pull men out of the home and give them a reason to be, to be away from their children, a justifiable and, a, and, a, and an understandable reason, even good situations get weakened and weakened and weakened. Children go off to school, children go off to sports teams, children go off to clubs, children go off to all sorts of things and then we create an, a, a culture that's so expensive, you kind of need two incomes. And the wives leave the, home, leave the home as well. And now we barely have this structure at all anymore. And we have lost the power point of growing boys into men. You see, the, the, the center, the headship of the, of the marriage and the center of the home is the heart of dad. It's, it's dad's desire to get things accomplished uh, that should be running the home. It's dad's faith that should be the driving uh, uh, point for the children. It's dad's perspective. It's dad's strength. Headship just between husbands and wives for a moment, but headship between the two of them is protection, it's provision, it's priority, loyalty. Christ doesn't have any other church. He is the head of the church. He doesn't have another body. He's not going anywhere else. Men, you're not interested in any other woman. Only your lady you are her head, and you don't look anywhere else but to her. Paul says in Ephesians, it's like nurturing and caring for yourself, nurturing and caring for her her day-to-day -day needs. Your loyalty, your, the head is constantly connected to the body, and we need to be men who are heads in our relationship. Headship is loving care. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. It's attentive, saving, protecting, loving care, and it's all based on sacrifice. It's all based on sacrifice. It's why I hate uh, calling uh, a mature man's uh, uh, devices his toys. Going out and playing with your toys is not a sacrifice. But if you need to go out and hunt and bring food home to your family, that might be a sacrifice because it can be difficult and dangerous. 
It might be a lot of fun too, but but the point is I'm taking care of my family, not I'm fulfilling my own life desires. The point is we are men who aim to take care of, lift up, protect, nourish. Ephesians 5 says the man is to nourish in connection with his wife. We need men, and we need to teach our boys to be men who know how to respect women and know how to love the Lord. Let's turn to Ezekiel, and we'll end end the lesson. We're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 22. This this lesson isn't much more than a a light. It's not much more than a, than a wake up. It's not much more. It's some, something you all already knew. But we can be lulled into complacency at any level. The teenage ears in the room, men and women teenagers, learn this lesson of God's roles in relationships that the young ladies in here insist, don't even begin to show an interest other than just friends with a young man who, one, doesn't love the Lord deeply and intent on following him, and two, wants to be a responsible, hardworking man. Don't aim for a young man unless he has those high goals. That young man will treat you with respect. He will treat you like a queen. He will sacrifice himself so that you're protected. And when he makes a promise to you, he will try to keep it uh, uh, as, as, as he keeps any of his promises to the Lord. And young men, you work on being a man like that. You make sure your life is is uh, tied to Christ, that you're covered with him, baptized into him, devoted to him, uh, uh, constantly loving and serving his church. You make sure that that's the center of your life, not your own sports, not your own desires, not your own games, not your own fun. I'm just having fun. I understand that. Fun is fine at times. But the Lord calls us to do great things. You be a man For the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 22, as I said, this isn't the only time God has had trouble like this. God uh, is speaking with Ezekiel, verse 23, and he warns him that in verse 25, Her prophets are conspiring. In verse 26, her priests have done violence to my law. In verse 27, her being Jerusalem, her being Israel. In verse 27, her her princes within her are like wolves. In verse 28, Her prophets have smeared whitewash to make things look good. And verse 29, her people, the people of the land, have practiced oppression and committed robbery. They have wronged the poor and the needy and have oppressed the sojourner, the traveler, without justice. God has a list of failures that his people, his own nation, his own beloved city of Jerusalem are failing to do. The priests are failing, the princes are failing, the prophets are failing. Well, maybe the people are living right. No, they're ignoring the poor. Foreigners come into their country, foreigners come into their city, and they're treating them like dirt rather than holding them up and protecting them like I told them to. Paul, and so God says, so I searched. I searched for, read this with me, verse 30. 
underline it, make a highlight mark on the, on the margin. I searched for a man. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. I shudder sometimes when I sang the song we sang a minute ago, a few minutes ago. My words are not enough, Lord, so listen to my heart. Just don't listen too closely. My heart gets real selfish sometimes. My heart gets real shallow sometimes. My heart brings up fears that I think are just childish sometimes. My heart stumbles sometimes. I can whitewash sometimes more convincingly than I can if you knew it was in my heart. But I sang it with you. God, look at my heart, because I want my heart right. When you find the blackness and the shadows and the, and the darkness and the weakness in my heart, could you get rid of it, Father? If God looked today to stand in the, in the place where men are missing, to stand in the gap, would he find some? Men, we need to be that man who reaches out to the poor, who listens to God's word, who welcomes the foreigner, who protects the body of Christ, who cares for his wife and holds her up like the princess God made her to be and is loyal to her and gives her deep security that she knows she's precious and valuable in your eyes and in your heart and in your arms. We need men who teach their children. We need men who provide and know how to work hard. We need men who will stand in the gap to protect what God says is precious and holy. You can start with your family and your church if you want to start someplace. Something God says is, is to be sanctified, that he makes holy your own family and those relationships and your congregation and those relationships. Stand in the gap to be a man who will defend and care for those things. Lead your wife, lead your family in those things. Show your sons what a man's supposed to be like and show your daughters a man who they should look the type of man they should look for to marry. This is just a, a wake up. This is not a wake up for you uh, uh, as much as it is a, a reminder of the struggle we have in this area of, of what we need to be helping uh, our, our society with, what we need to constantly be growing at in our own homes and our own relationships. Let's help men be men for the Lord. This morning, if there are any here who are ready to be baptized in the Christ, if you have uh, a desire to fix your relationship with God by, by uh, uh, joining Christ or have any other need that we can help you with, please come forward and sing the song that Isaac has uh, chosen for us.